Good evening. I am still getting letters about that very brilliant thing to be seen in the western sky after sunset. Well, as I've said several times recently, that is the planet Venus. And if you have a telescope or a pair of binoculars, you can see that it looks like a crescent. It's starting to set earlier each evening now, and by the end of the month we'll lose it for a bit, and then, in April, it'll reappear as a brilliant object in the morning sky before dawn. Well, the other evening, I made a drawing of it with the 15-inch reflector in my observatory, and there it is. You can see the bright crescent, and you can also see the unilluminated side shining very faintly. And that's what we call the ashen light. And it's probably due to high-altitude electrical storms in Venus's atmosphere. I must admit that in that drawing, I've very greatly exaggerated it, because if I'd drawn it as being no brighter than it actually was, I don't think you'd have seen it at all. It's an interesting phenomenon. There's also some news from a much more remote member of the Sun's family, and that is the little planet Pluto. And there's a picture of Pluto, which, of course, you can only see with a large telescope. And that picture was taken with a very large telescope, together with a piece of electronic gadgetry. Pluto is that object to the left. That bar through the middle is, of course, purely an instrumental effect. And over to the right, you can see Pluto's satellite, which we call Charon. And those two go round each other in a period of six and a third days. And some time ago, it was forecast that round about the 1985-86 period, the two would start passing in front of each other regularly and eclipsing each other, so that, of course, the total light we received would drop. And that has now actually started to happen. It has been observed. And that's going to be very important because by studying what happens, we should be able to find out a much better estimate of the sizes and masses of Pluto and Charon, which at the present moment we don't know at all accurately. And now I have a request. On the 20th of December 1984, at 02.15 in the morning, Andrew Gatwood of Halstead in Essex saw and photographed a brilliant fireball. And there's his picture of it. You can see the fireball there as it streaks across the sky near the bottom of the picture. Well, I don't suppose that that's dropped a meteorite, but we would very much like to find out the track of that fireball. And I just wonder if anybody saw it. If you did, would you please let us know? And let me repeat the time again. Uh, 20th of December last year at 0215. And now for a very long shot. One of the most famous comets in all history is quite a faint one. It was called Beeler's Comet, and it used to go around the sun in a period of six and three-quarter years, and it was seen quite regularly. When it came back in 1845, it astonished astronomers by splitting in half. And there's a drawing made of it in that year by the Italian astronomer uh, Angelo Secchi. Well, the twins came back on schedule in 1852, but they've never been seen again. Although for some time we did see meteors, or shooting stars, coming from that part of the sky where the comet should have been. Now, does Beeler's Comet still exist? Personally, I don't think it does as a comet. But new calculations have been made by Marsden and Seconina, and they find that if the comet still exists, it should be back this year. And round about mid-April, it should be somewhere near the star cluster of the Hyades in Taurus. Well, searches will undoubtedly be made. I don't think they're going to find it, because I think that Beeler's Comet has definitely broken up. But we can't be sure. And certainly, if we don't find Beeler's Comet again this year, then we never will. But of course, at the moment, everything is being dominated by Halley's Comet, which is now approaching the Sun and the Earth. It's still very faint, and it's over 400 million miles away, but it is coming in toward the Sun, and is causing a tremendous amount of interest. We have, incidentally, prepared a special newsletter about it, and um, I'll give you details about that at the end of the programme. Now, the comet's named after the second astronomer royal, Edmund Halley, and there he is. By the way, you can call him Halley. He probably called it Hawley. Not Haley, please. Haley is or was a pop group. I think Hawley's probably right, but most people call it Halley, uh, so I think i better do the same. Now, Halley was an interesting character. He was a very jovial kind of person. At one stage, he went on several scientific sea voyages, and his contemporary, the Reverend John Flamsteed, who didn't like Halley much, made the comment that Halley now talked and swore and drank brandy like a sea captain. He probably did. And there's rather a lovely story about him, which may or may not be true. 
Apparently, the rather ferocious Tsar of Russia, Peter the Great, actually came over to England at one stage to learn about shipbuilding, and he got to know Halley. And at one stage, after a very far from teetotal evening, the Tsar got into a wheelbarrow and Halley pushed him through a hedge. But I say that may be true. Halley would have been quite capable of such a thing. But he was also a very great astronomer, and it was he who was mainly responsible for persuading Isaac Newton to publish his great work on gravitation. And Halley was also a very good mathematician. He observed a bright comet in the year 1682. At that stage, no one knew quite how comets moved. It was thought they might travel in straight lines, just passing the sun once and then going off into space. But Halley calculated the orbit, or path, of the comet of 1682, and he found out it was remarkably similar to orbits of comets previously seen in 1607 and 1531. And he made the very bold prediction that they were one and the same comet that came back to a perihelion, or closer distance to the sun, once every 76 years. And therefore, he forecast that it would be seen again in 1758. Well, unfortunately, he didn't see it. He died in 1742. But he was, of course, absolutely right. On Christmas night, 1758, the comet was duly recovered, just about where Halley had expected, and it came to perihelion in early 1759. And since then, it's been back twice more, in 1835 and in 1910, and now, of course, it's on its way once more. But its orbit, or path, is a long, narrow ellipse, as you can see here. And uh, it goes out well beyond Neptune, at aphelion, or greater distance from the sun. And as you can also see from that, it spends most of its time in the outer part of the solar system. And since comets depend mainly upon reflected sunlight, we can only see them when they're reasonably close in. And so for most of Halley's 76-year period, uh, we lose it. And it wasn't seen, indeed, between 1911 and the time when it was picked up again in 1982. And you may remember we did a special program about it then. But certainly, this coming return is going to be full of interest. Comets used to be regarded as unlucky things and Halley's was no exception. And I can't resist reading you a rather delightful cutting from the New Hampshire Patriot, actually dated 1712, and a bright comet had been predicted, wrongly as it turned out, and it says, a gentleman who had neglected family prayer for better than five years, informed his wife that it was his determination to resume that laudable practice the same evening. But his wife, having engaged a ball at her house, persuaded her husband to put it off they saw whether the comet appeared or not. Well, I don't think it did. Well, Halley was last back in 1910, and it was then very bright. And there's a picture of it taken at the time. Remember, this was the first return at which the comet could have been photographed. Now, pictures were taken with a very famous camera, the double astro camera named after Franklin Adams. And there is a picture of that camera. It's now at Hartibusport in South Africa, and that's where I photographed it a few weeks ago. Now, that camera is going to be used to photograph the comet again at this return. And that's going to be very interesting. Now, a comet's nucleus, the only massive part, is made up chiefly of ices, and every time the comet comes back to the sun, those ices start to evaporate, and the comet loses a certain amount of mass. So it's going to be very interesting indeed to photograph the same comet with the same camera, under much the same conditions, bearing in mind that the comet is now 76 years older, and we'll see what happens. But by then, of course, Halley will have developed a tail, and comet tails are very odd things. When the comet's a long way out from the sun, it hasn't got a tail, and then as it comes in, the tail develops, and it always points away from the sun, so that as the comet swings round the sun, the tail swings round too, and when the comet starts to move outwards, it actually travels tail first. And there's no mystery about that. It is simply that the small gas and dust particles in a comet's tail are affected by what we call the solar wind, which is a stream of low-energy atomic particles coming out from the sun in all directions all the time. And they simply drive the tail away. And that's why a comet tail always points away from the sun. Now, Halley's Comet made quite a brave showing in 1910. But it so happened that, by sheer coincidence, a much brighter comet appeared shortly earlier, in January 1910. And that was known as the Daylight Comet, because it really was visible in broad daylight. And there is a, a drawing of it, made by my old friend Percy Wilkins. And that was very much brighter than Halley's Comet. And so, people who write to me and say, yes, I remember Halley's Comet in 1910, 
generally didn't see Halley's Comet at all, but they saw the Daylight Comet instead. But they certainly won't see it again, neither will we, because the Daylight Comet has a very long, very elliptical orbit, and it certainly won't come back to the region of the Sun for many centuries and probably thousands of years, whereas Halley's Comet is the only bright comet that we can predict. But Halley's Comet has another peculiarity. It goes around the Sun in a retrograde or wrong way direction. Let me show you what I mean. I've got a model here. There's the Sun. This represents the orbit of the Earth, and this uh, yellow arc represents part of the orbit of Halley's Comet. Now, the Earth goes around the Sun that way, and Halley's Comet goes around the Sun that way, so the relative velocity between the two is very high, particularly since the comet moves quickest when it's near perihelion. And also, the orbit of the comet is very sharply tilted to ours, as you can see there. And that has rather interesting consequences, because it means that the comet's going to make its closest approach to the Earth twice, once before perihelion and once afterwards. On November the 27th of this year, as the comet's coming in, it'll make its first closest approach to the Earth, not nearly so close as it was in 1910, about 60 million miles. And then, unfortunately, at perihelion, on the 9th of February next year, the comet's going to be on the other side of the Sun. And at that stage, we're not going to be able to see it at all. And ironically, our only chance of recording it near perihelion is from the Pioneer probe that's now orbiting the planet Venus. And then, after aphelion, on April 11th next year, then there's going to be the second closest approach to the Earth, again, a bit less than 60 million miles, and that's going to be the best chance of seeing it, because by then the tail should have developed. Unfortunately, it's going to get so far south in the sky at that stage that from here, I'm afraid we're not going to see it at all. Now, this is undoubtedly the most important return of the comet in all history, because for the first time, we are going to be able to send spacecraft to it and no less than five are going to be launched or have been launched. Two are Russian, the Vega probes, nothing whatever to do with the star Vega, rather an unfortunate name. Two miniature Japanese probes, and the most important one of all, the European Space Agency probe, Giotto. And that's named after the Italian painter Giotto de Bondoni, who actually used the comet as a model for the Star of Bethlehem in his famous picture, The Adoration of the Magi. And that's why this probe being given its name is going to be launched this summer. It's very much a British project, and uh, it was made mainly in Bristol by British Aerospace. And when I went down there recently, they very kindly gave me a model of it, and there is a picture of this Giotto probe. And that's going to be our one chance of going right inside Halley's Comet and telling us what the nucleus is like. Because remember, the nucleus is a very strange thing. We don't know a great deal about it. Because when the comet comes into the sun, the ices in the nucleus start to evaporate, and they produce, first of all, the tails, the dust tail and the gas tail, and, of course, the coma, which surrounds the nucleus and hides it completely, which is why we don't know quite how big the nucleus is or even where it is. And everything's going to happen over one period in March next year, when we hope to get pictures back, possibly like that, and I just wonder whether the nucleus of Halley's Comet really will be of that nature. We've got to wait and see. But it's going to be a very exciting period. The first probe to go by is going to be the Russian Vega 1. Then two days later, the Japanese probes, and then Vega 2. And this is a very nice piece of international collaboration, because those probes are going to try and find out just where the nucleus is inside the comet. And that may make it, make it possible to retarget Giotto at the last moment. And in the night of March the 13th, 14th, Giotto should go inside and actually send back data from the nucleus itself. And that's going to be a really exciting night. The information will come through to the great radio telescope at Parks in New South Wales with its 210-foot dish. And that's a photograph I took a couple of years ago. The information will go from there to Darmstadt in Germany, where the pictures are going to be electronically assembled. And that's where I'm going to be with the Sky at Night team. And I very much hope to be able to put the pictures on the television screens pretty quickly. We certainly can't wait, because I don't think there's any chance at all that Giotto is going to survive. When it goes inside the comet, it's going to be in an environment with plenty of chunks of ice and solid particles around, and I think it will certainly be destroyed. But we're, all we're hoping is that it will survive for long enough to send back this priceless information before it breaks up. So that's going to be the sequence of events. What 
are we going to see from here in Britain? And let me say straight away that we're going to have our best views in late this year before perihelion. At the moment, the comet is still very faint indeed, it's in the general area of Orion, and we shan't really start to see it with binoculars until oh, late October, early November, I think. And then, in November, it will track down through the constellation of Taurus. It will pass quite near the lovely star cluster of the Hyades, which, of course, is dominated by the orange star Aldebaran. And by that time, it should be a binocular object. Then, as it moves on, it will bypass the lovely cluster of the Pleiades, or Seven Sisters. And that should be a very good moment to identify it, because you can't mistake the Pleiades. But all the time, the comet is moving south. It goes down into Aquarius, it starts to go into the evening twilight, and uh, as it gets further and further south, we're going to find it more and more difficult to see. There's going to be a lovely chance on January the 13th, when the comet should be near the crescent moon and Jupiter, and that should be a really lovely sight. But then, as the comet goes through perihelion, we're going to lose it, I have said, and when it re-emerges into the sky once more, it's going to be well south of the equator, and we are not going to see it at all. That dotted line, below the name Formerhort, represents the limiting horizon from southern England. So I'm afraid when the comet is at its best, it's going to be way down in Centaurus, and we shall lose it. And when it comes back into our sky, which will be in April, uh, it will have faded very, very considerably. By the end of April, it will have reached the constellation of Crater, and then it should still be accessible with binoculars. It will get fainter and fainter all the time, and by the end of the year, it will become so faint that only large telescopes will record it, although we should be able to follow it for some years longer. Now, the very best time for seeing it is going to be in the first week of April 1986 from the Southern Hemisphere, because by then, the tail will have developed. And also, from there, the comet's going to be practically overhead. And so that's going to be our very best chance of seeing it. It's a great pity, I'm afraid, that we are not going to see it from Britain at that stage. Just one of those things. But there it is. And, of course, by then, the Giotto probe should have gone through it, and we should have found out what the comet is really like inside. And that's going to be a really great moment. Well, as I've said, uh, we have a special newsletter out. And if you'd like that newsletter, in the usual way, will you send a stamped wrist envelope, as usual, to Halley Newsletter, The Sky at Night, BBC Television, London, W12, 8QT. And in that newsletter, I put in the track and the details of where to see the comet and the actual positions for those of you who have telescopes equipped with setting circles. Well, I suppose there may be some people watching this program who will survive for long enough to see Halley's Comet next time round in the year 2061, when incidentally conditions will be even worse than they are now. But for most of us, it's going to be our one and only chance. So let's make the most of it. Above all, this is the year of Halley's Comet. Good night. <laughs>